At this time, we're going to dedicate our second son, Brixton. So if I could get the grandparents up here, and um, I don't even think I told them they're coming up front, but. Um, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what it means to dedicate a child to the Lord. Hey, buddy. So this is Brixton Everett Scheibel up here. He's just a little ball of joy. And these are Shauna's parents, Carol and Dave. And then my parents are here also, Ron and Shelly. And then that's our son, Harley, eating the donut. So, yeah. So today we're dedicating our second child, Brixton Everett Scheibel, and I wanted to share a verse with you all up on the screen from Psalm 127.3. It said, Behold, children, our heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, the womb is a reward. So I'm going to try not. <laughs> I've been crying a lot lately. But <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, kids are such a blessing, and you know God has given us the tremendous responsibility of raising our kids in the ways of Jesus, and He entrusts us as parents with the responsibility of establishing a good foundation for our kids, built upon God's Word, and you know teaching them what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and, and they're watching us and like you know Harley's starting to repeat sentences from us everything and so you know and I it's so important I think that there, our kids catch us reading our Bibles that they catch us reading catch us having our quiet time with the Lord but in view of this responsibility, baby dedications are actually, I believe, family dedications. The enti entire family needs to be lifted up in prayer so that family members will be empowered to keep their responsibilities. And the idea of dedicating a child to the Lord is certainly found in the Bible. You remember Hannah promised to dedicate her child to God if he would give her a son. And in 1 Samuel 1:11. It says, then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And so God honored Hannah's request and gave her uh, her son Samuel. And she dedicated Samuel to the Lord. And that word dedicated means to be set apart. And so she set him apart to raise him up in the ways of the Lord and, and to train him with God's word. And we also see in Luke chapter 2, Mary and Joseph took Jesus to the temple and they dedicated Jesus um, in the temple to the Lord also. So to dedicate a child to the Lord is to make a vow to completely submit your child to the will of God and raise that child in the ways of the Lord. And parents publicly commit to raise their children in a Christian home and guide their child towards a personal relationship with Jesus. So by dedicating a child to the Lord, parents make a vow to raise their children in God's ways and not their ways or even to not raise their kids in, in, in the world's ways. The responsibilities God has entrusted to Christian parents include continualist prayer for their children, instructing them in the way of the Lord, and setting a godly example, and also disciplining our children as God disciplines um, us. So as parents, our commitment to God, or lack of it, will make a resounding impression on this generation. And our prayer is that our legacy as parents would be a godly legacy. And you know, right now I think why a lot of America is falling apart is because our families have been attacked and parents aren't staying together. And um, so we're, we're definitely on a battle, and you know, I want to be able to pass the baton on to this next generation when I'm long gone, if the Lord tarries, um, and see them charge for Jesus even harder than you know, we did. So I'm going to have Shauna share about Brixton's name. Okay, 
make sure and get your mic. Okay. Hey, okay. buddy. Okay. So, Ryan really wanted to be in person, and it really it took a lot for me to agree to it. But, <laughs> if I'm honest, but I actually really love it now. Um, so, the name Brixton means seeker of truth and wisdom, and, like, obviously, like, that's a good thing. Um, and then when we were praying about, so actually, we were going to name him Theodore, Theodore Brixton. Um, and then we saw him on the ultrasound, and I was like, that's not a Theodore. <laughs> he is way too rambunctious to be a Theodore. Um, he could have been Theodore. Not him. So, um, anyway, so then I was like, okay, Lord, it's like, what should we name this kid? Um, and the Lord put on my heart Everett. I really, A, I've never met a mean Everett ever. So, like, that's good. That's a good starting place. But then I read, like, the definition is um, strong and brave and hardy as a wild boar. And I didn't, like, initially realize that a boar was, like, a day. So, like, Oh, okay. <laughs> Once I like, looked in, I was like, oh, that's awkward. Maybe we shouldn't do that. But then, when I read about wild boars, so rad. So they come into an environment, and they tear it up. And so, like, what was changed. And now they, like, just change it. And I was like, how amazing. If we raise this child in Jesus, and, you know, we do our best to give Jesus the rest of what a prayer we could have for him that he would be a seeker of truth and wisdom in Jesus. And when he goes into situations, because he's praying for such a time as this, right? And so he goes into situations and he tears it up for Jesus. He changes the culture, the kind of um, that situation. That's what God wants to do. They change the essence of the situation and they make it something new. And I was like, wow, what an awesome, strong name for this boy. Um, and so that's kind of how we got Brixton Everett. And our prayer is just that he would know Jesus, he would love Jesus, that he wouldn't seek truth and wisdom in the world, but just in, in God's word. And, and that we'd be able to lead him that way. And then as we send him out, our parents are called to do right, because our kids hopefully won't be with us till they're 40. Um, we'll send him out into, into the world, and they're going to be you know, changers in their workplace and in their homes and leading their kids and having a legacy. So, yeah. Thank you. All right, so right now, let's just pray, and then maybe if my parents can just put hands on Shauna or the baby, and yeah. All right, so let's bow our heads. So dear God, we just want to thank you for the gift of this young man, Brixton Everett Scheibel. We thank you that you've entrusted him to our family to raise him in your ways and to train him in the ammunition of your word. And God, I pray that Brixton would just grow up just to be a mighty man of valor, that he would be just a, a David, a, a Moses, a Joshua, and that he would truly would just be in love with your word and that he would want to do your will. So whatever, God, that you have planned for this young man, God, I pray that you would reveal that to him in your timing and that he would run with that wholeheartedly. And God, I pray that many... would come to know you through his life and through his testimony and his witness and his boldness and bravery. I pray you protect him from the enemy. I pray that he would just charge for you, God, I know he was born for such a time as this. And Lord, we just thank you for his life. Lord, I pray that he would just desire to walk in your spirit all the days of his life. Lord, that you would just bring him an amazing woman of God. And that he would raise up his kids, his generations in your ways. And so we dedicate Brixton now to you, God. And we thank you for this opportunity to raise him. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Awesome. Well, you yeah, you may be seated. <laughs> so, yeah. So if you have a Bible, we'll be in John chapter 10. If you don't have one, feel free to grab one on the table in the back. And feel free if you need a water, or we have restrooms in the back over there. Feel free to to get up and use those if you need. So today's message is called The Good Shepherd. And we're going to be looking at John chapter 10, verses 1 through 21. And I thought we could just start off by reading Uh, the first 10 verses. Now, what do you notice about the first 10 verses right off the bat? Do you guys notice anything in your Bibles? The red. And so when they're red, what does that mean? Jesus said it. These are the words of Jesus. So let's start in verse 1 and continue to verse 10. Most assuredly, I say to you, He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Verse 7, Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So in the previous chapter, we looked at chapter 9 last week, Jesus wonderfully opened the eyes of a man who was born blind. And we saw that there was people that were pretty upset about this. They were the Pharisees, and they were upset because Jesus healed this blind man on the Sabbath day, But this blind man, when confronted by the Pharisees, what did he do? He stood up for Jesus. And he said, that man opened my eyes. And the Pharisees said, well, if that is how you're going to look at it with your new sight, we're going to kick you out of the synagogue. They excommunicated him, and they said, you're kicked out from our religion. This guy was kicked out, and then it says in chapter 9 that Jesus went and he found this blind man after he was kicked out. Jesus sought him out after they cast him out. And this guy was kicked out of the flock of Judaism, but Jesus does what the good shepherd does. He leaves the 99, and what does he do? He goes after the one that is lost. Uh, Psalms talks about how David wrote, he restores my soul, and that word restore in the Greek, it, it's a term that means to flip right side up a sheep that has been cast down. And so that's what the shepherd does whenever a sheep eats too much, you know, they get top heady, they get sleepy, and they get on their back, and you know, they're just ready for a nice wolf to come in, uh, munch on them for dinner. But the shepherd will go and seek that cast sheep out and flip them right side up. So Jesus finds the one that was kicked out, ostracized, and he makes himself known to this man. So in that conversation that Jesus has with this this previous blind man, he goes right into the discussion that we're going into today in John chapter 10. And he says, I want to talk to you about shepherds. I want to talk to you about the good shepherd, talking about him, and I want to talk to you about bad shepherds, who are those guys that just kicked you out. 
and who are giving us a hard time. So Jesus gives a very familiar illustration with the shepherd in his relationship to his sheep. And so back then it was a common theme because people were dealing with a lot of agriculture and livestock back then. And so this whole idea of the shepherd and the sheep is a very simple but very important point that Jesus uh, brings up. And in verse 1, Jesus talks about the sheepfold, the sheepfold. And a lot of people don't know what a sheepfold is today. Uh, But in Bible days, it was a place where the sheep were kept, and it was pretty much a safe place at night for the sheep to hang hang out. And it would be kind of like a corral for horses or a pig pen for pigs. And the sheepfold was a place where the sheep could be uh, safe at night. And 2,000 years ago in Israel, there were two kinds of sheep folds or sheep enclosures. There was the kind that you would find in the village, and then there was the sheep folds that you would find in the pastures out in the countryside and the mountains that the shepherds would build for them. So verses 1 through 6 of John chapter 10 is about the first kind of sheep enclosure that's in the villages that you would find. Those ones had a door, a literal door that you would have to open and close. In verses 7 through 10 is about the second type of enclosure, and this is the one that you would find in the countryside. And... that one, the actual shepherd would lay in the doorway. There was actually no door. The shepherd was the door in verses 7 through 10 in that sheepfold. But in the village, several shepherds would place their flocks, plural, into a communal um, pen every night, and they would bring them in, and the door would be closed. And you would have like a watchman or a porter who was an under-shepherd, was stationed to guard them, but the one in the village was more of a taller, fenced-in area or walled area with a gate or door. But then the, so the shepherd, when he gets to the village, he would put his sheep in the village uh, sheep fold, and then he would go home and get a night, a good night rest, you know, take a shower, eat some food, and then in the morning he would come to that sheep fold and he would get his sheep out. But the watchman would watch during the night to make sure no thieves would break in and steal. And so in the morning, when the shepherd came, he would make that very distinct call that his flock understood. And the sheep would follow him out to the countryside where they might be there for a day or a few days in the pasture or in the mountains and then come back later on. And that's how it worked in those days. But in the village sheep pen... It's where all the sheep were placed together. So just say I had a flock and Ken had a flock and Reggie had a flock and Boris had a flock. So you'd have all these, you know, and Dave and Ron and Rex, we all have our, you know, flocks in this giant, probably sheep full the size of this. And they didn't have numbers back then on the sheep. They didn't have brandings. And, but the sheep all knew their shepherd's voice. So all the flocks would be in the same pen in the village. And the call of the shepherd was was very distinct because we all have a different voice. And so that's how you would tell which sheep were yours, just by you would call into the sheep pen and your sheep would come out. And if you have a pet, I know Rex has a dog, but your dog knows your voice pretty well, doesn't he? Pretty good? Yeah, but I, I would say that, you know, dogs know our voices pretty good. Cats, on the other hand, I don't think so. You know, they remind me more of, you know, sheep. They're pretty bad, and they're pretty <laughs> sheepish as they're just always wandering around. But I read an interesting story of a man, and he was arrested for stealing sheep. This guy was arrested literally for stealing sheep, and they were his sheep. But this guy accused him of arresting um, or accused him for stealing his sheep. So it went to trial, and the judge and the jury, they couldn't figure out, is this this guy's sheep or not? And so they finally go through all the evidence and everything, and the judge says, you know what, I'm going to bring out the last um, witnesses. Can I call the sheep to the front? And so he literally brought all the sheep to the front of the courtroom. 
and he had the um, accuser go and sit in the hallway and call for the sheep. And the sheep were just like, nah, they didn't budge. And then he brought the accuser in, and then he said, all right, the guy that's being accused to be the thief, I want you to go in the hallway and call for the sheep. Boom, right away, all the sheep went out and followed that guy. And the judge said, case dismissed. There's your shepherd. He's not a thief. The sheep knows the shepherd's voice. But the Bible uses the metaphor of sheep throughout the Bible. And it's a beautiful picture because it talks about how we are God's sheep. The Bible says in Psalm 23, 1, that who is our shepherd? The Lord is our shepherd. God is our shepherd. And as you know, sheep need to be led. Uh, sheep need shepherds. And the same is true with us. We need God's guidance. He's our chief shepherd. He's the one that we need to take our marching orders from and be led by him. We need to depend on him. And sheep who have no shepherd are called lost and dead. Uh, there are so many people in this world today that are lost. They're wandering around like sheep. They're dead in trespasses and sins, not knowing where they're going because they don't have Jesus Christ as their chief shepherd. They don't have Jesus as the leader of their life. And Jesus in Matthew 9.36 said, when Jesus saw the multitudes of people during his ministry, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. In Luke 19.10, Jesus said that he came to seek and to save those who were lost. And in verses 1 through 6, it involves several things that we want to look at. And number one, it involves criminals. Jesus said in verse, um, let's see here. One, he who doesn't enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up another way, the same is a thief and a robber. Now, criminals back then would try to climb over the rock wall and they would try to take a sheep or two and they would run out with that sheep without the shepherd seeing them. But what I found intriguing is there's two kinds of criminals that Jesus mentions in verse one. What does he mention? He mentions thieves and robbers. So a thief speaks of one who is more quiet and who comes in stealthily, you might say, but a robber is someone who's very violent and forceful and really doesn't care if he makes a lot of ruckus or not. You know, we might say he comes in, you know, guns, you know, hot blazing, and he doesn't care if he gets seen and takes what he wants and leaves, where a thief is very quiet and very cunning. And, you know, the enemy, he will disguise himself in all different kinds of way, ways. And this is very interesting because Jesus, back in John 9, is dealing with the Pharisees. He is dealing with the religious leaders and picturing them in two ways. Number one, very quiet and cunning. And number two, very forceful and violent as it pertains to the flock of God, the people of God. And what is an interesting picture... Because even today, we see that type of mentality. We see some leaders come against us, and they try to fleece us in a very quiet and cunning way. And now we're starting to see persecution move in, too. And they're starting to get violent. They're starting to um, be a lot more vocal. And we're seeing a, a lot of leaders who are run by the enemy in, in these different ways trying to deceive us. And these, Jesus said, these religious leaders are thieves and robbers who try to explain how life works, what life is about, but they, all they want to do, they just want to rip you off. They want to mislead you from Jesus. And, you know, that is the way that Satan always works. He wants us to get sidetracked from our relationship with Jesus, get us sidetracked from the Bible and to follow, you know, I, I've heard there's a million ways to hell but only one way to heaven. And so the enemy will try a million different things to just get us off course of Jesus, right? And so we gotta be super 
dedicated to God's word and make sure we know it. That way we, we can get that red flag and say, you know, that, that's not what God says. That's not what's in the word of God. But this brings us to the second thing we want to look at in this illustration, and that involves shepherds. If you look at verses two through five, as a shepherd, you would spend a great deal of time with your sheep. You're out in the pasture land all day, every night, and no doubt, you know, you would probably be talking to your sheep, building relationships with your sheep. You are probably nicknaming your sheep. Um, when I was, I, I got an opportunity to go to Europe for Bible college, and we did a missions trip to England, and I got to hang out with a, a sheep um, flock one time and a shepherd, and it was a, a lot of fun. But um, the sheep really did listen to their shepherd, and it was really a cool uh, sight to see. And I mean, they were massive sheep, um, huge. But they were accustomed to the shepherd's voice. They know your voice and they're comfortable in following you because they know that you're watching over them, you're protecting them, and that you're feeding them. And there's two kinds of shepherds that I've seen. There's, you know, the one kind of shepherd that will be behind the sheep, you know, with a stick or a rod or a whole bunch of dogs, and what do they do? You know, that they're whacking the sheep, beating the sheep, yelling at the sheep, driving them. But then you have these other shepherds and you know, they'll just be walking in front of their sheep, leading them, and all of a sudden you just see, ma, ma, and they're just so, these happy little sheep just following their shepherd, because they know their, their shepherd is good to them, and, and they don't have to be driven from behind, because they just know how loving and caring and good their shepherd is. And they're willing to follow that shepherd. They don't have to be driven by force, but it's a beautiful picture of a kind of relationship that Jesus wants to have with us. Jesus is that second shepherd. He, you know, he gives us free will and he wants us to follow him, but he won't make you, he won't force you to have a relationship with him. He wants us to hear his voice. And that is one reason why we come together on Sunday and throughout the week uh, to get into God's word so we can hear God's voice. And we hear God's voice by having a Bible study so we know the voice of our Lord, so we don't fall prey to strangers, thieves, and robbers. And he wants us to follow him willingly and freely. And, you know, sometimes we do wander off like sheep, but this is just a, a great picture of the love of God for each of us, not coming behind us, driving us, hitting us, or forcing us, but going out ahead of us, showing us the way, giving us that free will, that option to follow him or not. And I just love that leadership. I do so much better thriving under a leader, you know, who I just get to follow rather than just been, you know, who cracks the whip on me. But shepherding, it sounds like a fun life, right? We say, oh, you know, what a peaceful life. You're out in the field, um, but it's super risky. Uh, Jesus said, I lay down my life for the sheep. You guys remember King David in the field? I think I have a picture of him. Um, you know, before David was king, he was a little shepherd boy. And if you remember when he was being interviewed by King Saul, David said, you know, I used to be a shepherd and I'm really good with my sling. I'm really good with my fist and, you know, with my stones and my slingshot. And whether a bear or a lion came in and took a sheep, I would chase them down, take that sheep from that lion, and I would kill whatever tried to harm my sheep. And I would deliver it um, from its mouth. And I think you would agree, that's pretty dangerous work to be a shepherd back then. And even today, Every year, about a quarter million sheep get taken by predators. It's kind of interesting. Um, but in verse 7 through 10, it said, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And so in the village enclosures where all of those communal flocks were kept, the walls were high. 
but out in the pasture lands, in the countrysides, the walls were usually a lot smaller because it would be the shepherds that would be gathering all the, the rocks and they would actually make their own little pen for their sheep so that it would be a lot smaller. Um, just stones piled up. A little simple enclosure was made with no door and the sheep were put in but there was no door at the entrance and what was crazy is the shepherd would lie in the door entrance of the sheep enclosure and there's a man named george smith who was visiting the middle east and he was out in the countryside with a shepherd and the shepherd was showing him what his job was all about and kind of giving him a tour introducing him to his sheep and showing him the routine of his day. And the shepherd led his sheep and led him into one of these enclosures. And George said to the shepherd, well, what are we going to do now? Where's the door? And the shepherd told him, I am the door. And I lay right here in front of my enclosure. So you can see that shepherd right there. That's where he would sleep. And the shepherd told the man, this sheep can't leave but over me, and a wolf can't come in but over me. And you've heard that saying before, over my dead body, right? And I think that's a beautiful saying for this picture here. Jesus says, I am the shepherd. I am the door. You're not going to get to my sheep unless you come through me. And that speaks of safety and protection. And how many doors were there to the sheep enclosure? Well, there was only one door. And Jesus said, I am the door. And here we see the third I am statement of the Gospel of John. Jesus says, I am the door. It speaks of safety and security. Jesus said, I am the door, and all the others are just thieves and robbers. You know, those who think they're going to usher you into truth and the meaning of life and insight, they are thieves and robbers because I alone have the words of eternal life. Now, the interpretation here is very simple for all of us to understand. Jesus is the door to the sheepfold, and if we want to become one of God's sheep, we have to enter through the door of Jesus Christ. In other words, getting to heaven isn't based on our performance. Getting to heaven is about coming to Jesus and entering through him. Uh, Jesus said in John 14, 6, that I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And so no one's going to be in heaven unless they accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior and believe that he died on the cross for their sins and he rose again three days later. That is the only way to have Jesus as your Lord and Savior to get to heaven. And those who try to get to heaven another way, Jesus warns us continually, that way leads to destruction and eternal torment an eternal place called hell and God doesn't wish that upon anyone and he's made a way for all of us to get saved and to be forgiven of our sins and make it to heaven but verse 10 look at verse 10 this is a powerful verse the thief does not come except to steal to kill and to destroy I have come that they may have life and that they may have it to the max, uh, more abundantly. So notice the contrast. Jesus is contrasting the thief and the shepherd. And the contrast is Satan, God reveals Satan's plan for us. What does he want to do? He wants to steal, he wants to kill, and he wants to destroy us. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the max, to the full, to the brim. So what a contrast from Satan's plan for our life and God's plan uh, for our life. And isn't it so sad how so many people are giving into Satan's plan, you know, for their life? And you've heard people say, 
You know, Jesus loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Very true. But you need to hear the other side of the coin. Satan hates us, and he has a miserable plan for each one of our lives. And so if you want to be a happy sheep, learn to say no to the one who's trying to kill, steal, and destroy you. And it's hard to stand up in this world and and say no to the world's ways. It's painful and difficult. But the better choice is to say yes to Jesus and follow his way. You know, the Bible talks about how broad is the road that leads to destruction and very narrow is the way that leads to Jesus and to everlasting life. But we need to follow Jesus' way because he will lead us into all truth and will give us an abundant life and eternal life. An abundant life is speaking of our life right here, right now. We might say a very full life, a satisfied life. And I think this becomes very important for each one of us because as we look around to the world today, life is looking pretty sad. It's looking pretty depressing. As we see our own nation heading away from God to a godless, secular kind of society. And what's happening is there's so many God haters. Before it was just God rejectors. Now it's escalating to God haters and persecution is ramping up. And as we see the moral and spiritual fiber of the world corroding and corrupting, and we see it circling down the drain, the Christian life isn't based on our circumstances. Because we go through a lot of difficulties in our life, but we can still walk around with that Christian smile. We can still walk around with that joy in our hearts and that peace that surpasses all understanding, even though what's around us is crumbling. Why? Because we have the joy of the Lord, and no matter what I'm going through, this is just temporary. And Jesus, he can literally come back for his church for us any moment. And our citizenship is in heaven. And so until then, God has a mission, and he's got a plan and a purpose for each one of our lives, and he wants to use us. And we were all created for such a time as this to occupy all streets wherever God has us and to be um, witnesses for him to share him with other people and point people to the truth and so let's look at verses 11 through 18 Jesus says I am the good shepherd the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep but a hireling he who is not the shepherd One who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I am known by my own. As the father knows me, even so I know the father. I lay lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay down myself. I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. So I see four things that characterize a shepherd in this text. Uh, The first thing we see that we can learn about is that the shepherd is good. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. So God is good. Jesus is good. Uh, Psalm 34, 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Uh, Psalm 25, 8 says, good and upright is the Lord. So God is good. That is his nature. That is his character. That is who he is. And this is really interesting. In John 10, 11, we we're told that Jesus is the good shepherd. In Hebrews 13, 20, he is called what kind of shepherd? The great shepherd. And in 1 Peter 5, 4, he is called the what? The chief shepherd. 
So all three of these characteristic traits are very important and very specific. And this blew my mind when I studied this. Because the good shepherd speaks of his death, laying down his life for the sheep. In Hebrews 13, 20, it talks about the great shepherd, and that verse is all about Jesus' resurrection. So you have the death, you have the resurrection, and then in 1 Peter 5, 4, when Jesus is called the chief shepherd, this speaks of his second coming, where he's going to be the king of kings and the lord of lords. And it also correlates in the Old Testament, if you look at Psalm 22, 23, 24, we find the Shepherd's Trilogy. Uh, Psalm 22 speaks of the Good Shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. It talks about the death and the crucifixion of Jesus. Psalm 23, um, it talks about the Great Shepherd who leads his flock in the way they ought to go. And he is there with them, uh, caring for them, giving guidance and protection for them. And in Psalm 24, it talks about the coming of Christ, the Chief Shepherd, the coming King. And so when you have a chance, I really encourage you to read Psalm 22, 23, and 24 all together, as it's just like this really beautiful trilogy uh, that correlates with the three terms that are used to describe Jesus' shepherding ministry. He's the good shepherd, he's the great shepherd, and he's the chief shepherd. Uh, the second thing that characterizes the shepherd is that he gives. Verse 11, the good shepherd gives his what for the sheep? His life for the sheep. If you look at verse 15, it says, the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 17, the father loves me because I laid down my life that I may take it again. And I want to get this straight. Nobody took Jesus's life. He gave his life um, willingly. And, you know, they might have nailed Jesus to the cross, but they didn't kill Jesus. Look at uh, Luke 23, 46 I have on the screen. Jesus said when he was hanging on the cross, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, and he breathed his last. Jesus gave his life away for us. He willingly, freely gave his life for the sheep. And that is a picture of how much God loves us. Uh, Paul said in Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated his own love toward us that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. In John 1, 4, he said, uh, God loved us and gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he, what did he do? He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. John 15, 13, greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. And that is exactly what Jesus did for you and for me. He laid down his life for us. He willingly died as the good shepherd, the great shepherd, and the chief shepherd so that we might have everlasting life. Now, you know what I found interesting is not only that Jesus had power to lay down his life, which he did, but according to verses 17 and 18, what did he have power also to do? Take it up again. Jesus resurrected himself. And we're about to get deep here, okay? He had power to lay down his life, but he also had power to raise it up again. So Jesus Christ resurrected himself from the grave. And the reason that is so interesting is because in Acts 10.40, what does the Bible say? That who resurrected Jesus from the grave? God resurrected Jesus from the grave. And then in Romans 8.11, it says who resurrected Jesus from the grave? The Holy Spirit resurrected Jesus from the grave. So which is it? Did Jesus resurrect himself from the grave? Did God resurrect Jesus from the grave? Or did the Holy Spirit resurrect Jesus from the grave? Yes, okay? All three of them. Um, how can that be? Well, according to 1 John 5, 7, the Bible says that these three are one. 
the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It speaks of the triunity of the Godhead, three separate persons, all in one. So the third thing we learned about the shepherd is he cares. And we see this by way of contrast. Look at verse 13. We see the hireling does not care about the sheep. Now that is in contrast to the good shepherd who cares about the sheep. And the reason is because in verse 12 is because the the good shepherd, he owns the sheep. The hireling doesn't own the sheep. And I don't know if you knew, but God owns every single one of us. We belong to him. And the question is, are we allowing him to own us and lead us? and do what he has called us to do. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. The shepherd owns us, and the question is, are we allowing him to guide and direct us, and are we following his lead? Uh, Jesus calls the religious leaders thieves and robbers, and now he calls them hirelings. In other words, this is only a job for them. Uh, they don't care about the sheep. They're in it just to, for the money or, or taking advantage for the power. But the hireling, he is not the real deal. Jesus said the hireling is not the shepherd. The hireling, verse 12, they see the wolves, they see the bears, they see the lions, and do they stand in the front of the gate and say, you know, over my dead body? No, they run the other direction and leave the sheep, you know, for a nice juicy meal. Uh, you know, but the tr true shepherd would say, over my dead body, are you going to touch these sheep? And he'll do everything he can to fight for them and defend them and protect them. The true shepherd, like David, killed the lion. He killed the bear, risking his own life when he was just a shepherd boy. And Jesus said that is what a real true shepherd does. He cares for the flock. The hireling, he doesn't care. The good shepherd's concern is to feed the flock of God and to bring them into good pasture. Uh, feed them, to feed them food so that they can grow. Remember what Jesus told Peter. What did Jesus tell Peter? Feed my sheep. Uh, Peter wrote, feed the flock of God which is among you. And so the good shepherd seeks to feed the flock healthy meals. And, and talking about spiritually, um, that's God's word. And so when we get into God's word, partake of God's word, we're, we're feeding spiritually from God's word so that we can become strong and healthy so we can detect when the enemy is trying to get us to do something that God is opposed to. And the fourth and final chapter character trait of this shepherd we see is he brings. In verse 16, what does he bring? He brings in other sheep. This speaks of you and me, the Gentiles. Um, because Jesus is a Jewish Messiah. He came for the Jews because the Jews are God's chosen people. They are his primary flock. And God loved them so much, he sent the shepherd, the Messiah, to the Jews, but also for the non-Jews, for the Gentiles. Uh, Paul said in Romans 9.24, Us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So the primary flock are the Jews, and that is one reason why we love Israel. That is one reason why America has had a, a strong relationship with Israel, because we were founded on, on the Word of God, and the Word of God says, hey, love the Jews. You know, God loves them. And what's sad is they're trying to rip out the Bible out of America, and now they're trying to rip out our relationship um, with Israel. But God loves the Jews so much, and so we should have a huge love for the Jews also. Uh, Romans eleven seventeen says that we have been grafted into them. You being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. 
And so Paul is very clear. We are a wild olive branch. And I know a lot of you are had a wild days. I know I did. Um, but we have been grafted in to the true olive branch. The branch doesn't support the roots, but the root supports the branch. So we praise God because we're accepted into the fold, the flock speaking of God's chosen people. And that's something that we can rejoice about. But let's look at verses 9 through 21. Therefore, there was a division again among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, He has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? I mean, can you just imagine the audacity to tell God in the face he has a demon? Like, that's crazy. So what did this teaching of Jesus result in? It resulted in a division. Some said Jesus had a demon. The others didn't think he had a demon. Some were his sheep and heard his voice and followed him, and some were not his sheep and rejected him. Um, and Jesus said in Matthew 12, 30, you're either for me or you're against me. And the point for you and me in all this section is simple. Simply, if we are his sheep, if Jesus is our shepherd, we need to be attuned to his voice and follow him. Not what we think or feel or what other people are trying to tell us, but we need to do what the Bible says. We need to know his voice and hear it and follow him because there's so many people that are trying to lead us astray today. And I don't know where you're at with your walk with Jesus, but right now is the time to really abide in Jesus, to, to have a strong relationship with him, to get into his word, to, to yoke up with other brothers and sisters. And I pray if you haven't been walking with Jesus and you've been sidetracked by the enemy that today you would make a decision to follow Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior or rededicate your life to the Lord. And I know there's probably some people watching online. You can make that decision today to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And it's crazy how, you know, I, I watched a Bible prophecy conference this week and things are unfolding fast. And we're seeing all the pieces of the puzzle in the Bible fall into place. And the biggest thing during that prophecy, what they kept on bringing us back to, is to look up. Because you know what that means? When everything's fallen into place, Jesus is coming back to rapture his church. And we're not destined to the wrath of God, which is really cool. So as all these end time things are, are literally happening in our world today, like Jesus really can come back today, tomorrow. And so he tells us to be ready and to, to be prepared like a soldier. And um, if you're not prepared to meet Jesus Christ or ready for his to return, you don't want to be left behind because Jesus first, he's going to come back and rapture his church. And then after that, that's going to start the seven year tribulation. And it's going to get really intense and really gnarly. But the Bible says encourage one another in these things because believers aren't destined to the wrath of God. And so we're going to be in heaven with Jesus during that tribulation. And then we're going to come back with him riding on horses and we're going to rule and reign for a thousand years here on this earth. And guess who's going to be on the throne? Jesus Christ. And he's going to be the king of kings and he's going to be the Lord of lords. And, you know, one thing that was really crazy during the... Um, the prophecy conferences, they brought up weather. And they said how weather has a very, God is using weather right now to wake up his church. And he says in the Bible that during the last days, before I come back, the weather's gonna intensify. Well, we had our hottest summer ever recorded in 2021, last year. And the weather people are absolutely astonished they can't explain it. It's, they said, this is not something man created. Something's going on. And we're seeing floods, we're seeing 
fires and everything's intensifying. The Bible calls it its birth pains. You know what I know? I mean, I, I would love for Jesus to come back. But there are so many lost people still. And the Bible says he isn't, we don't know the day or the hour. And I know we want Jesus to come back badly, but I know God also wants a lot of people to get saved, you know? And one pastor explained to me, he said, I bet Jesus is up there. He's ready. And he's, uh, he's ready with his army. But he's just holding back. Just one more. Just one more for Jesus. And and I was listening to a pastor several months ago share about his dad. And his dad was a gnarly Christian, and like he would build build churches all over the world. And his motto was, one more for Jesus. Just one more. And I think he was like in his 80s. And he had an opportunity to go and build a church. And his family was like, don't do it. Like, you're old. And he said, one more. One more. And I think, I don't know how much time we have left, but... It's, I believe it's coming really soon. And I think that should be our motto too that God wants us to have is one more for Jesus. And so, that's why it's so important for us to be good witnesses of Jesus, to teach people the truth of Jesus and and to preach the gospel. And so if you're watching online and you want to give your life to Jesus, or if any of you do here, um, let's just close our eyes and I will lead you in a prayer to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior or recommit your life to the Lord if, if God's tugging on your heart to do that. So if you want to make that decision today, just please repeat this prayer after me. Dear God, thank you so much for your love for me. Thank you for coming to this dark world on a mission to save me from my sins and the consequences of my sins, which would have been eternal separation from you in a place called hell. God, I I turn from my sins now, and I want to follow you as my shepherd. I want to get off the throne of my heart, and I want to put you on the throne because you're the king of kings, you're the Lord of lords, you're the one, the only one that can get me to heaven. God, I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose again three days later. God, I need your spirit. Help me to walk in your spirit all the days of my life. And God, I pray that you would use me however you'd want to use me. I dedicate my life to you to do your will. Help me to reach others for you. In Jesus' name, amen.